tonight we're going to talk about Christ's second coming, but he's already here. <laughs> we're going to be able to see him in person. <laughs> Praise ye the Lord. He's going to be riding a great white horse too. I believe with all my heart we're going to be following him with the, the host of heaven, the angels of heaven. So. How many appreciate the presence of God? Isn't it good? It, it's all right. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That's exactly right. So if you want to get refreshed and renewed in the Lord, you got to practice His presence and you got to simply wait on Him. And as you wait on the Lord... He will supernaturally come and fill you with his wonderful goodness because the Lord is good. Shout somebody. He's great. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we just want to say tonight as we get ready to, to read your word and study your word tonight that, that we love you, God, more than anything in all the world and we're so grateful and so thankful for your will and for your purpose that you've given us, which is the Bible. And Lord, none of us claim that we have a monopoly on the gospel and that we understand everything in your word, Lord. But we're students of your word and we're studying. And so, Lord, I pray as we get into your word that you will enlighten us and speak to us and encourage us. And let us walk more and more in the light of God. And we pray now in the name of Jesus. And if you're in agreement, say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Some of my teachings, in fact, they were cleaning out the closet uh, here at the church with a lot of my old sermons. And they said, Pastor, what do you want to do with the old sermons? I said, please throw them away. Because <laughs> I have new light that I'm walking in. <laughs> Because <laughs> the more you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, the more teaching that you have to teach the light. So some of them old teachings, I didn't want anybody to ever hear them. Come on. <laughs> so I said, throw them away quickly. <laughs> oh, God help us. All right, if you got your Bibles, we're in uh, Matthew chapter 25. I thought that, would, uh, that was funny for me anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't want anybody to hear any of those old teachings. <laughs> God, oh my goodness. You just learn more and more through the years, and, and the Lord gives you more and more light to walk in. And So praise the Lord. Thank God for the light, and it's getting brighter and brighter in all of our lives. Okay, so we're talking about the second coming of Christ. We're in Matthew chapter 25, and of course we just did uh, Matthew chapter 24, and we talked about the end time events. Now, I believe, in, in, and if you got a different belief, it's all right, okay? We can agree to disagree, but this is what I believe, unless someone else can show me different, and I'm open to, because I don't claim I know everything, and I'm growing and learning every day. But this is what I believe concerning the end times. I believe that the rapture of the church is going to take place, first thing. And I believe that, that right now rapture could happen at this second. I don't think there's any more prophecies that we have to, to get fulfilled before the rapture of the church. I think that rapture could take place at any time. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight, too, because we're going to talk about the the, wise, the, the virgins, the ten virgins, ten were wise and ten were, uh, five were wise and five were foolish. And I want to talk about what I think foolish is in the church. How I many you know you need to be right? So you can't be playing church. I, I'm giving it away already. You, you got to have some oil in your lamp. So I want to talk about that oil a little bit tonight. But I think the first thing that takes place is the rapture. I believe that the church, which is interceding and standing in the gap for the glory of God, is holding back the forces of darkness. And so when the church is raptured, 
the intercessors are gone, meaning that the church dispensation or age is over with. Um, and then, of course, we meet the Lord in the air. Y'all know the scripture, First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. The Lord shall descend with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, at the last trump of God. Um, and and um, those that are alive shall be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. And the dead in Christ shall rise also to meet the Lord in the air. And then we'll go back to heaven. And I'll talk about a Jewish marriage and why I think it, it lines up exactly with the, the three phases of a Jewish marriage. Because it lines up perfect. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So the rapture takes place. When the rapture takes place, then that's when the, the man of lawlessness... The Antichrist has full reign on planet earth because the Christian church is not praying against the forces of darkness anymore. And that allows him to be able to have full reign. Now, he's, there's sin in the world, yes, I know, but the Christian church is holding back the forces of darkness for, from total manifestation. So then when we're gone, then the devil, it's just going to get crazy in this world. I mean, like tribulation crazy. And that will start the tribulation. I believe the tribulation is seven years. And I use the 70th week of Daniel. Um, the, um, the abomination of desolation that Jesus talked about in Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. I, I use those scriptures um, to, to, to prove that it's going to be a seven year period I believe. I believe uh, the Antichrist makes a peace treaty. With the Jewish people, and after three and a half years, he breaks that peace treaty. And as a result of breaking that, that peace treaty, then, then I believe the temple is going to actually be built in Jerusalem. And the uh, Antichrist is going to go into the, uh, the temple, the Jewish temple, and desecrate it. And uh, ultimately, he's going to say that I'm God and worship me. The Jews are going to realize that they've been deceived. That, that this is an imposter, and, uh, and then the, the Antichrist is going to tell them, you're either going to do it my way, take the mark of the beast, or we're going to kill you. And so there will be many people that are martyred for their faith, and then uh, you'll see another three and a half years of hell take place on planet earth, and then at the end of the seven years, I believe that the church with the angelic host in heaven Jesus Christ riding a great white horse, the Word of God, King of Kings, will come out of heaven and Jesus will end the war, at, um, which will be the uh, war of Armageddon right there. And then he'll set up his millennial kingdom, which will be a thousand year reign. Um, the, the, the devil, the Antichrist will be actually cast into the abyss for a thousand years while we have peace on earth, the Lord rules planted earth with peace. And then after a thousand years, uh, the devil will be let out of the pits of hell just for a short season. He'll, he'll, he'll rally any other rebellion in planted earth that wants to come against Christ's reign. And then God the Father will reign fire out of heaven. Revelations chapter 19, 20, and 21, and 22 fire will come out of heaven and devour all the rebellion and all the contamination of this world and then the, then you'll see the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven and God the Father and the Lamb will actually be the light of planet earth there will be no more need for, for moon because the Bible says that God and Jesus themselves will be the light of planet earth and so shall we live forever with with God the Father and the Son Jesus here on planet earth for eternity. And that, that's what I see in the scriptures. Now look, I'm telling you, I don't have a monopoly. I'm not claiming that I humbly submit it. So that's what I see in the end, end times, just in a nutshell, from my heart, just speaking about the end times, that's what I see. Now let's take a look at... Uh, Matthew chapter 25, and we'll look at the, the virgins now. We'll look at wise virgins and foolish virgins. I mean, you know, we're wise. 
So that's us. I'm talking to the wise. Verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps, and they went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, but five were foolish. They that were of the foolish took their lamps, and they took no oil with them. What? But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Now just leave that scripture right there. Let's start to think about what Jesus is actually teaching. What I believe is, is that the Bible says that the foolish ones had no oil. Here's what I believe, church. I believe that God has called the church, the ecclesia, the called out of the world, and has organized us as an assembly, as a community, the God family here in planet Earth. But I believe that there's tares and wheats. Wheat. I believe that some folks are sold out to God and are burning Holy Ghost oil. And I believe that some people are playing church. And they don't have no oil. I believe that they look like they're a lamp. And they look like they're a member of the body of Christ. But the thing is, 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 is you can look good, smell good, taste good, and not be what you look like on the outside because on the inside you ain't got no oil. So God has given us all the tools we need. He's given us the lamps. But we have to make a decision as a free mortal agent To take what God has given us and work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That means that all of us are responsible for what God has given us to do with what he's given us, the tools, and what he wants us to do. That means that I can't just look good. I got to be good. And I'm not talking about earning your way. What I'm saying is, is that you can't live on my faith. You can't live on my gifts and my calling and what God's called me to do as I'm doing it. You are responsible for your own life. You are responsible to get oil for your lamp. And, and, and here's... They all slept. That means that that they were doing life together. They were all walking it out. They were on the journey for the kingdom of God. They were all together. When the bridegroom was gone, they slept because they waited on the bridegroom to come. And the bridegroom could come in five minutes or he could come uh, in ten hours it, it took time in, with a Jewish uh, wedding. And so they were waiting by the road so that when the bridegroom came, their, their job was to light their lamps and light the road so that the bridegroom could see his way to the bride. And so they were all in it together. But the problem is 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 some folks look like they were really doing the work and fulfilling the mission, but they really wasn't because they didn't have on the inside what it took to fulfill the will of God. What am I saying? I'm going to beat this horse to death. But what I'm saying is is that you got to be the real deal. You've got to have real oil on the inside. You, you've got to have the, the, right, the, the right manifestation. In other words, when the Lord comes, you've got to be the real deal. 
You've got to really have oil in your lamp. It's got to really burn for the glory of God. You can't fake church. You can't play church. You can't act like you're something that you're not. And that's what Jesus talked about later is you'll have your place with the hypocrites. They acted like they were something that they wasn't. And at midnight, verse 6, there was a cry made. They said, behold, the bridegroom, he's coming. Go out and meet him and shine the light for him. Then all those virgins rose. The whole church rose up. They trimmed their their lamps. They, They cut the black off, the soot, so that they would have a clean wick that would burn right. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give me some of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered and said, Not so, because there won't be enough for me and you. You got to get your oil for yourself. But go and to the town and where they sell oil and, and quickly buy for yourselves. And so while they went to buy oil, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went with him to the marriage. And the door shut. I mean, you know, when Jesus comes back, got to be ready. Verse 11, afterward came also the other virgins later who went to get the oil. And they said, Lord, Lord, open to us. And look what the Lord said. Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I never had a relationship with you. The next scripture says, watch then therefore. The watch right there is not so much that you're looking out the window every day for the Lord to come. The watch is is that you're living a spiritual life for the glory of God. Every day you're living for God. Every day you're loving God. And you're ready. If the Lord comes back right now, your heart is right. There's oil in your lamp. You've been serving God with everything that's within you. You're not foolish. You're wise. Watch, therefore, because you don't know the day nor the hour when the Son of Man comes. Now, the Jewish marriage... There's three phases that I think lines up perfectly with the rapture, with the Lamb's Supper in heaven, and with Jesus Christ coming back to set up his millennial kingdom. It's betrothal, presentation, and celebration. Now we'll look at the first one. You're betrothed. To Christ. And what does that mean? When a, when a man went to marry a woman, he went to the woman's father and paid some kind of dowry. And when he paid the dowry, they signed a contract that My son and your daughter are now legally married. But in a Jewish marriage, you couldn't get the woman until you had a house. So it wasn't no such thing as you showed up off the corner with your pants hanging down. And you're talking about you're going to marry my daughter. And you ain't even got a job. You've been doing uh, 44-ounce curls, Colt 44. (laughs) So a Western mindset for a marriage. Are y'all out there? (laughs) God help me. I'm probably going to be in trouble after this night. Jesus. (laughs) All the corner people are going to show up. What'd you say? (laughs) But with our Western mindset of marriage, it's almost like if it doesn't work, I'll divorce you and get another one. 
But a Jewish marriage is more than just the man and woman. A Jewish marriage actually is a picture of God's relationship with his church, with his people. And so, so when, when they signed the contract, what, what happened with that is, is the woman still stayed with her dad, but the young man and the dad went and they provided a place for, they got ready for the woman to come to them. In other words, usually at the dad's house, they built onto the house at dad's house so that when they went and got her, she would stay at, at dad's house for presentation. And then they went and built their own house, which is celebration when ultimately he was able to take his wife to their own house. And those are the three steps. So the first thing that we see is, is Jesus came. He paid the price, the dowry for all of us because we were sinners. And he shed his blood through his death, burial, and resurrection, which was the dowry for all of us. How I many of you know Jesus paid the price for all of us? And then he made a covenant. So the contract, he, he issued a contract, which is the covenant that we have with God. And then what he will do is, is, is he left us where we're at. Then Jesus Christ will come back in the air. And he will actually uh, rapture us out of, out of planet earth. Take us to his father's house for a season. Because he's, he's got a place for us. And he'll present us to the father. And what the Father will do is, is we will actually uh, feast and, and, and hang out at the Father's house for seven years. And then after the seven-year period where we receive rewards and crowns and, and fellowship with Christ in heaven and the rest of this, uh, all the angelic hosts that's in heaven, then after that seven years, then Christ will actually bring us back to planet earth and he will set up our home. And there we will be with Christ, married to him in the millennial kingdom and that will be celebration. So here's the, the three phases. Betrove, present, and celebrate. That's a Jewish marriage. Come on now. That's what Jesus is doing for all of us. Shout somebody. All right, so let's take a look. Revelation chapter 19. We'll start at verse 6. We'll try to make it to verse 21 tonight. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. And as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Now how important is that? Omnipotent means what? He has all power, right? All power in heaven and in earth. How many of you know that the Lord is still in control? He is sovereign. Verse 7. So, so now what they're doing is, is they're rejoicing and they're praising God with their voices in the midst of heaven. And they're praising God because God has all power in heaven and earth. And, and even though they went through all the things that we've gone through in a place called planet earth, yet God has still been faithful in every one of our lives. Even though this world has been riddled with sin and the sin nature and with evil, yet God in the midst of all that we walk through is still faithful and God is still omnipotent. 
God is still on the throne. I don't care what you're walking through tonight, no matter who you are. I'm telling you now that the Lord is faithful. The Lord is powerful. The Lord is still on the throne. Everything's going to be all right. The Lord is still in control. Don't you ever think God is not in control because you're walking through a little something, something. God's allowing you to walk through what you're walking through because He's using what you don't think is good for you. He's even using the bad for your good. God knows what He's doing. Even when you don't. He knows. And that's why they're rejoicing in heaven right now. And he says, let us be glad and and rejoice in what? Give honor to him. For the marriage of the lamb is what? Is come. And his wife has made herself ready. That's why I don't believe that the church is going to go through the tribulation. And the reason why I don't believe that is, is because I see the church right here in heaven at the marriage lamb supper. And so if the church is in heaven with Christ, how could the church be on planet earth during the tribulation period? Some people say, well, well what, about, what about the people getting saved? Listen, the Holy Ghost is still working in planet earth. The tribulation is actually what God's doing with the tribulation. The hardship is, is he's actually using it to separate the chef from the wheat. Meaning that the, what people go, listen, it's your pain that brings you to God. You find God in, in the valley, not on the mountain. You don't find God when everything's right in your life and when you ain't going through nothing. You find God when you're under it. First thing you do is, is when you're under it, God help me. Lord, please. So you get close to God when you go through tribulation. I don't know about you, but that's how I found the Lord. And then when I look back at all the hard stuff I've walked through, which everybody in the world judges you for, let me tell you something, you don't ever judge someone. You don't know what God's doing through their hardship. You don't know what God's doing in their heart through the mistakes and the sin that they're walking in in their lives because God is using that to teach you His will and His purpose. God's developing character in you. All the hardship, all the battles, everything that you go through, God's using every bit of that for His glory. And that's why they're rejoicing in heaven. Because they're saying, God, you're omnipotent. You're all-powerful, God. Even through the midst of all the hell I walked through, you were still faithful. You were still with me. You still brought me through. And now look at me. I'm in heaven in the glory of God. And all the voices in heaven. And these are all the people that have died from Adam all the way to the church. Are y'all out there? All of them have, uh, they're in heaven. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul said that I'm in a strait between the two, having a desire to depart and to be with the Lord, which will be far more greater than having to stay here and put up with all you and preach to you to see some of you get saved. I'd way rather go to heaven. He says, but for the sake of all you crazies that I'm called to reach... I'm kind of like, oh, I sure am ready to go home, though. But if I go home before I preach the gospel, some probably ain't going to make it. So are y'all? So my point is is that, that when you die, your spirit and your soul leave your physical body. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And then you go to be with the Lord. Now, I believe that actually resurrection takes place at the time of rapture. And there's a scripture, and I've been looking for it all day. And um, I I haven't, I didn't see it today. So I've been racking my brain on it, looking for it. But I had so much other stuff to think about, I couldn't keep looking for it. But there is a scripture that talks about the resurrection and that it manifests at the same time of the rapture. And I'll find that and I'll give it to you. So I I logged it in my heart. I know it's there. Um, 
And, and I believe at that time you receive a glorified body, which what will happen is, is when you die, your spirit and your soul leave your physical body. Uh, your body goes back to the dust from which it was ultimately created from in Adam. And then when, when you get ready to resurrect, God supernaturally takes your old physical body, some kind of way that decayed, and it rises up and God does a supernatural miracle and causes it to, your, your new body to become a glorified body like Jesus' body that walked through walls and doors. And also, um, it has the ability to, to, it's not limited by time like we are in space. Meaning that this body could, you, you could be in Chicago like that. It's almost like you think it and you're there in this body. Um, as well as um, you, you have access to the spirit realm where you can actually um, go to heaven in, in this body. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a spiritual, a spiritual supernatural space suit. <laughs> I guess you could call it that. Help me, Lord. But the Bible says that this mortal shall take on immortality and this corruptible shall take on incorruption. In a moment, in a twinkling of eye, you, you, sh you shall be changed. And so some kind of way the Lord uses your old physical decayed body and some kind of way uses that, those components if I could say it like that, and gives you a glorified body supernaturally out of that. And then he houses your spirit and your soul in that new body. And you, it'll be a body that you can, you won't be limited like we are in the physical realm. Can I get an amen? So um, that's the best way I can decipher that in the scriptures. All right, and in verse 8, he says, and, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. This is um, talking about the saints that are in heaven, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, write, blessed are they which are called. Now, by the way, we're called in the name of Jesus because there's nothing but wise virgins in here. Called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. So how many of you know that, that if you're serious with God, you're sold out to God, you're totally living for God from your heart, then blessed are you because you're called by Christ to the marriage lamb's supper. Shout somebody. That's you. And I fell at his feet to worship. Now this is John the revelator that is on the island of Patmos in prison for his faith. And now the Lord has given him a vision. Either has taken him out of the world to the third heaven so that he could see or some kind of way in a vision, he actually saw heaven. But whatever way he got the revelation, he's in the spirit realm. And, and the angel, uh, it, this is actually a mortal man. I'll show it to you. It's actually a man that's showing it to him. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. Watch this. Because I'm just like you. I'm a fellow servant. And of your brethren, I'm a brother of yours, that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So I believe it, that he was a mortal man. And that that mortal man was actually given uh, John a, a vision. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful, true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. All right, now, when Jesus came on his first advent, he came with grace and truth and mercy. He rode a humble donkey. 
but he's traded his donkey in for a new model, a war horse. This great white horse that Jesus is on is a warrior. This is, this is a horse that is created by God for war. And it's, he's not humble. Jesus is, is um, coming back as a lion. Come on now. Not a lamb. So, so he's going to be actually uh, executing the judgment of God for rebellion. And he's ridding planet earth of rebellion. So now, here's the plan that I see that God is doing in planet earth. The Lord is actually ridding planet earth of rebels. So I'm telling you now that if you still in your heart feel like you want to be a rebel, you still want to live for yourself and do your own thing, you don't really want to sell out to God, I'm telling you now, you got an opportunity because Jesus is still riding the donkey. He's still a lamb. But there's coming a time when he's going to be the lion. There's coming a time when he's going to be riding a war horse. And it's going to say in his vesture a name that no man can read but only God. It's going to have three things in his vesture. He has a name that no man knows. He's called the Word of God and King of Kings and Lord of Lords will be in his vesture. And his vesture will be dipped in blood. And he is serious business. Because he starts talking about at this war right here, uh, the the buzzards are going to be able to have plenty to eat. And so what Jesus is saying is, is that I came on a donkey. I was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of all the world. I piped to you. I danced for you. I reached out to you. I sent the Holy Ghost to draw you, to speak to you. But you didn't want to serve God. You wanted to be a foolish version. Even, you wanted to even play church. For whatever reason, you were, it wasn't in your heart to really serve the Lord. And so the Lord says, now when I come back this next time, I'm going to be carrying the judgment of God, the execution of the judgment of God, and because the mission is, is that we're going to rid planet earth of all rebels, all rebellion against God, because God will have a planet where the whole planet loves God with all of their heart, that they serve God with everything that's within them, and in their heart is praise and worship for the great God of heaven and earth, because God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. God, God, uh, God is omnipotent. God is everything. And so we worship God because God alone is worthy of all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We give you glory, God, because you are everything to us. We love you more than anything in all the world, oh great God. We worship you. That's why we got to worship God because, because God is worthy. He alone. In Him we live, we move, and we have our being. In Him we have life and life more abundantly. Without Him we wouldn't even be in existence. We owe God our allegiance. We go, owe God our lives. We owe God everything because without God we wouldn't be. We owe God everything. We worship Him with all that we are because He alone is worthy. And man, if you haven't got that in your heart yet, I'm telling you now, it's going to be too late one day when you hear His voice and you say, I'm going to run to town and see if I can get some oil. Because the store has been open every day of your life. And you had plenty of opportunity to get you some oil for your lamp. 
and do the will and the purpose of God. But instead, you were too busy with your own life, doing your own thing. And therefore, you kept putting God off and putting him off. And I'm telling you, you can only put God on the back burner so many times before before grace runs out, before God's Spirit doesn't strive with man anymore. Man, and please, I'm not preaching condemnation here. I'm just preaching fact. You got to serve God with your heart. You got to love God because God is everything. Everything you ever want or think that you want in your life will be found in one place, and that's in God. So what you think that will satisfy you and fulfill you in this world, if you get a hold to God, it will happen. He'll add those things to you. So what you think you want in your life will actually come through God. Somebody said, well, wait, I have these desires. Well, God will even change your desires. Because when I was in the world, I thought I had desires for things that, that I thought if I served God, then I would never have any more fun anymore. Some kind of way I'd be dead. It would be stale. It would be a boring life. And then I gave my life to the Lord because I got so miserable that I didn't care anymore. I said, whatever it takes to serve you, God, I'll do it. And when I stepped over by faith, making Jesus Lord of my life, the things that I used to think would satisfy me no longer satisfy me because I had a different spirit in me. Now I wanted God. That's how that works. So what you think you want right now, when you give your life to Christ, He will change you. And you won't want what you think you want, if that makes any sense. Verse 12, and this is Jesus. This is Jesus when He traded His donkey in. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head, and I just remember. Do you remember Peter? Y'all remember Peter? You remember the kindness of Jesus when, when, when Jesus was arrested and he was in the kangaroo court in the middle of the night? And, P- and Jesus had told Peter, he says, by the, by the end of tonight, before the sun rises, Peter, you'll deny me three times. And, Jesus said, oh, and Peter said, oh, Lord, I will never deny you. Jesus gets arrested. Peter's hanging out in the shadows, watching. A little old girl comes and says, you were with the, the, that gang with Jesus, wasn't you? Oh, no, no, I don't know the man. And the third time that Peter denied Jesus Christ, we heard the rooster crow. Arr, arr, arr. Uh, that was a sickly rooster, huh? He had a sore throat, okay? He had a sore throat. He, he needed some of that sore throat stuff. <laughs> Just before daylight, denied Jesus the third time. And when he did, the rooster crowed. And the Bible said, and I'm talking about the look, Jesus' eyes. The Bible said that as soon as the rooster crowed, Jesus being judged in the kangaroo court, Look just like this. And Peter on the outskirts in the shadows look like this. And the eyes of Jesus and the eyes of Peter met. I mean, you know, Jesus didn't have to say a word. He said it all in his eyes. When he saw Peter's eyes. And Peter saw Jesus' eyes. The Bible says that when Jesus comes back, he'll have a flame of fire in his eyes. And on his head will be many crowns. And he had a name that was written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture that was dipped in blood because he's going to war. 
and his name is called the Word of God. Now, why is it so significant that Jesus is called the Word of God? Because the Bible says that when the Father speaks, Jesus executes. Jesus is the Word of God. Whatever, I can only do what the Father says to do. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father because I'm the Word of the Father. I'm the Word of God Himself. And so Jesus has in His vesture the Word of God. And the armies which were in the heaven followed Him upon white horses, and that's us. And we're clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of Jesus' mouth goes a sharp sword. You know, the Bible says the word, of the, uh, the word of God is a sword of the Spirit. Listen, there's no way you can wage war in a place called planet Earth against demons that hate you and mean-spirited people that are coming against you unless you know the Word of God, because the Word of God is the sword of the Holy Spirit. So when you speak God's Word, it releases the sword of God to wage war for you. And this sword goes out of the mouth of Jesus, that with it it should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he tread up the winepress of the fierceness and the raft of Almighty God. That's what he's doing. And, and here's, here's what's happening. The United Nations. The world powers of planet Earth. Russia. The United States. Syria, Egypt, Germany, all of them are coming to Jerusalem because what they want is is they want world power. So the nations want to take the world over, and they want one world government. And so are y'all And so what's happening here? Is, is the nations that want world power are going to Jerusalem to wage war because they want to take the world over. And so when they get to the Megiddo, the valley of Megiddo, and I've been there on top of the mountain looking down in this valley. It's a perfect war valley. I just could see all the armies coming from the north, the south, the west. They were coming to the valley to wage war and the, and, and the, and because they're trying to take the world over. And then the Bible says that as they all get there in their rebellion, the Lord Jesus Christ shows up. Are y'all out there? And that's why they, they call him King of Kings because he's taken the nations over. And Lord of lords. And so that's what's written in, in, in his vesture. In verse 17, And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven. Somebody says, where? Yeah, in heaven. Of course, there's three heavens here. Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Now how many of you know that you want to go to the Lord's Supper? You don't want to go to the buzzard supper. The buzzard the the buzzard <laughs> the buzzard supper. <laughs> the invitation for that supper, you know where you get a ticket? Is rebellion. It's sin. But I mean, you know, the ticket of the Lord's Supper, come on now, is sold out to him. So that, that's the supper that I'm signed up for, and I want to see you guys signed up for the Lord's Supper and not the buzzard supper. I just got that. <laughs> the Lord's going to eat up all rebellion. 
all sin, all disobedience. Man, we just got to be sold out to the Lord, guys. Because our righteousness is in Christ Jesus. So we're saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but then you reap what you sow. So don't think that you can go live like any old devil in some kind of way be blessed. Because you can't. There's no way you can live against God and expect God's blessing in your life. So get that out of your mind. You got to serve the Lord with your heart. And you got to sow the right things in your life for the sake of reaping the right things in your life. So, man, you don't want to live like the devil. Man, you don't want to live on the edge. You know what living on the edge is? It's just like this edge and that cliff right there. And you say, let me just see how close I can walk to the edge without falling. Man, look, just get that out of your heart and mind. Just, just sell out to God and live over here. Somebody said, man, can I lose my salvation? I'm going to let you think for, the, for a second. Because I can find scriptures in the Bible that say you can lose your salvation. I can find scriptures in the Bible that says you can't. I think some of you need to doctrine both ways. Hallelujah. So the Lord, however you want you need it, the Lord will get that word to you. So I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know if you can lose your salvation or not, but I ain't taking no chances. So you go ahead and. You go ahead and live your life any old kind of way you want to, but I know how I'm going. I'm walking over here. If you want to walk by the cliff and see how close you can get and, uh, and live like the devil because God's got you, and you, you uh, just go ahead and keep fooling around down at the river bank with that, that, with that white waters passing in the river, and you just real close down to the edge, and it's slippery. See what happens. So I'm going to live for the, for the glory of God with all my heart. Man, I'm going to serve God with everything that's within me. Because my heart wants to do that. I love God more than anything in the world. And I didn't mean I'm going to be perfect. And, and yes, I, I know that I, I'll make some mistakes. But I'm not going to knowingly, intentionally, habitually practice and living against God. Man, I'm going to live for God with my heart. Because it's in me and I want to. Can I get an amen? Man, it is 8.04. Can you believe that? I have already been up here almost an hour. So he says this, verse 18, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast. And the kings of the earth and their armies that had gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Now actually they turned their wrath towards Christ to even fight Christ. And the beast was taken and, and with him the false prophet. I mean, you know, that, that, that's, these guys are responsible for, for, for stirring up the raft of men or the rebellion of men to come against God. And with, uh, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which sword proceeded out of Christ's mouth, and all the birds were filled with their flesh? Are y'all out there? So here's really what happens. The beast and the false prophet are actually casted into the, the lake of fire. And the Bible says that they're shut up in, 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 in the abyss for a thousand years. And then after the thousand year, if you read uh, Revelation 20, 21, and 22, you get the rest of what's actually going to happen in the end times. They're released, and then they, they go and make war with people that even during Christ's reign, the millennial, still wasn't wholeheartedly serving God. And they still 
um, had rebellion in them. And the, and the devil is able to take that seed of rebellion in people. Are y'all out there? I mean, you know that the devil can have nothing in you or he can have something in you. So if there's seed of rebellion in you where you're, you're not sold out to God, you're not sure you really want to serve God, you're still serving yourself, you're still living for the world, you're still living for the things that are against God, and that is still in you, then that gives place to the devil to be able to actually stir you and draw you. Like the Holy Ghost can draw you, the devil can draw you when you're not right. Because the only thing that protects us from the devil, and I'm circling the airport, the only thing that can protect us from the devil is God and our heart after him to love him and serve him and when we say that we love God with all of our heart it releases God's hedge and God's favor and God's blessing around us so that the devil has no way into us here's what here's what the uh, the devil told God concerning Job God says, have you seen my servant Job? He said, well, yeah, of course I've seen him. And everybody knows Job. He's blessed because you bless his hand. Everything he touches, it's gold. You cause it to multiply. So I guess we all know him. We've all been watching him. And in fact, if you will give us permission and take your hand off of him, if you'll pull the hedge back that you've got around Job, I'll make him curse you to your face. And the Lord said, all that Job has is in your hand. Only don't do anything to him personally in his body. And the Bible says that the hedge that God had placed around Job, the Lord pulled it back and allowed the enemy, the devil, to get in, which ultimately stowed all of his wealth killed his kids man that's tough ain't it how about that mama all your babies one day gone not only that every bit of wealth the big house you live in mortgage companies coming to get it you know why because God realized that there was still something that Job needed to experience through some kind of hard trial or adversity in his life that God was going to prove and show his greatness in. And so the Lord allowed that hedge. My point is this, is when you love God with all your heart, God puts a hedge of covering around you. Now, if that hedge comes back in some kind of way you walk through a difficulty, some kind of adversity, some kind of tribulation in your life, you can know this in your heart, that you are God's. And any kind of demonic attack, any kind of attack against you is father-filtered. God allowed it to take place in your life because God knows what he's doing. God sees the big picture. I only see right here. I'm limited in my vision and my perspective of life. But God knows everything there is about me. And so if God allows it to take place in my life, then I say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God's going to use it for his glory in my life. Even when I don't understand why I'm walking through what I'm walking through and I have served God with my heart and there's been a hedge and God has blessed everything that I've touched and now I don't know why things are going wrong things are falling apart I don't understand why why I'm being attacked but I know one thing God no matter what I go through in life I'm serving you for your face and not your hand I'm serving you God because I love you not for what you've given me I love you for you I'm serving you come on stand up tonight we got to get out of this place Woo. maybe God may prove to you 
that you're rich. But maybe God may allow you to prove that you serve God for not what you have, but for who He is. By the way, the Lord gave it to you one time, He'll give it to you a second time. Because Job ended up with twice as much as he ever had before. The Bible says, he says the new daughters he got was gorgeous. So I don't know. I don't know what that means. That they was good looking. I don't know if the first ones were as good looking. Let's say it nice. <laughs> Father, we did thank you tonight. We're serving you with all of our heart, right? 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 Are we serving God with all of our heart? Are we sold out? And I thank you, Lord, that we're wise virgins, God. And though, Lord, we've gone to get oil for you in plenty of time, Lord, before you come back. We've made a decision, God, that we will serve you no matter what we walk through, no matter what we go through, Lord. We will serve you with all of our heart. And now, Lord, we bless you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Give God glory in this place tonight. Father, I lift up all of our people. I pray that you continually cause increase, favor, and blessing in all of our lives, God. Now bless your people tonight in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords. Have a great night. We love all of you, and we bless you in the name of Jesus.